Hi, and welcome back to the CISS Aero Academy. I'm Cyrus Hung, and today we will be looking at the types of drag. Let's get started. Today we will be covering three main subjects, parasite drag and its three subtypes, induced drag, and total drag. First, a recap. Drag is one of the four forces of flight, and it is the force that directly opposes thrust. It acts in a path opposite to the flight path, and must be overcome in order to move forwards. The first type of drag we're going to be discussing here is parasite drag, which is simply resistance offered by the air to anything moving through it. As we said in the last video, it may be helpful to think of it as aerodynamic friction, in that thrust causes drag to be generated, slowing an aircraft down. Now, what's interesting about parasite drag is that it increases exponentially. Specifically, it increases with the square of speed. That means that if your speed is multiplied by 2, your parasite drag is increased by 4 times. This is very important to know for aerodynamics, as thrust is also connected to lift. Not accounting for parasite drag and its effects can easily cause an airplane to crash. Parasite drag has three subtypes, as shown here. They are, in no particular order, skin friction drag, form drag, and interference drag. Though they are different, they each share the common characteristic that they increase as the airplane speeds up, and is caused by air resistance. We will be looking at each of these subtypes in the next slides. We will begin by looking at skin friction drag. This type of drag is, as the name suggests, a type of drag that occurs on the surface or skin of the aircraft. Though an aircraft may appear very smooth on the outside, it inevitably has small dents and interruptions on its surface. This provides small spots where wind gets trapped, causing pockets of idle air to form. This in turn causes skin friction drag. The more official explanation for skin friction drag is aerodynamic resistance experienced by the aircraft due to contact of air with respect to the surface of the aircraft. One important thing to note is that air, like other fluids, is viscous. That means that it acts in a sort of sticky way. The stationary air molecules created by skin friction drag slows down the layer above it, which slows down the layer above that, but slightly less, which slows down the layer above that. This goes on and on until we go back to pretty much the original speed of the wind. These layers of slowed down air caused by the viscosity of air affecting each other is called the boundary layer. As the molecules flow past the surface and past each other, the viscous resistance to that flow becomes a force which retards forward motion. The amount of friction drag that is created per square meter of surface area is relatively small. However, with bigger airplanes, skin friction drag can be a big problem as the boundary layer covers almost all of the aircraft. There are two types of net boundary layers, laminar and turbulent. In a laminar type boundary layer, different levels of air slide past each other smoothly. This is the most preferred type of boundary layer, though it does still generate skin friction drag. Another type of the boundary layer is the turbulent boundary layer. In this boundary layer, irregular turbulent flows and little eddies or vortices occur, and the airflow is disrupted and thrown into chaos. This increases the size of the boundary layer as well as the amount of airflow disruption in it. These increases result in more air molecules being affected by the movement of the aircraft and a corresponding increase in friction drag. A turbulent boundary layer can generate 5 to 10 times more skin friction drag compared to laminar flow. Small bumps and imperfections of a plane surface, even small insects that get hit by the plane, can trip the airflow going past it, thus transitioning from a laminar flow to a turbulent flow. One goal in aviation is to delay this transition as much as possible so as to reduce skin friction drag. Thus, to reduce skin friction drag, you can smooth the exposed surfaces of the airplane, usually through cleaning, waxing, polishing, or applying surface coating. This delays the transition from laminar flow to turbulent flow. Next, we will be looking at form drag. Form drag results simply because of the turbulent wake caused by the separation of airflow from the surface of a structure. That may sound confusing, so let's try to provide a demonstration here. 
Say we have a flat block of wood obstructing some airflow. Because of the Kawanda effect, the wind sticks to the object's surface and tries to reach behind it. This creates stagnation points and low pressure wake areas. In this scenario, the wood block is said to be unstreamlined, and thus causes a lot of form drag. As you can see here, because of the compressed air at the front of the block and relative lack of air at the back, this creates two zones, a zone of high pressure and one of low pressure. This zone of high pressure pushes back against the area of low pressure, thus causing form drag, opposing thrust. So, how can we reduce form drag? The answer lies in either streamlining or reducing the aircraft's cross-sectional area. Let's take a look at a real airfoil, which is basically a cross-section of an airplane if you look at it from the side. As you can see here, the amount of low-pressure wake zones and stagnation points have gone down significantly compared to the flat block we saw before. The form drag was reduced to 10% of a flat plate. The other method is to decrease the cross-sectional area. It may be helpful to think of this as just reducing the surface area of the airfoil that comes to contact with the air. In this way, you create less form drag as you intercept less wind. The third and final type of parasite drag we'll discuss today is interference drag, which is a special drag that occurs when different currents of air meet and interact. Basically, it's what happens when the disruption of airflow from different objects come together. When two objects that are disrupting airflow are adjacent, they can create 50% to 200% more drag than if they were separate. Letting these air currents interact with each other can cause a significantly higher amount of drag compared to when they're separate. Interference drag occurs between several components of an aircraft, especially at places where they are connected. These are spots where different air currents created by the parts of an aircraft meet and interact. To reduce interference drag, strategic placement and usage of fillets and fairings can be used. These are structures put onto an airplane that are designed to use curved surfaces to allow for airflow streamlines to meet gradually. This eases the transition between the different air currents around the components, thus reducing interference drag. Next, we will talk about a whole new type of drag, induced drag. This is a type of drag that is an inevitable byproduct of generating lift and is generated when a wing is driven through air to produce differing pressures. If this sounds familiar, it's because producing different pressures is a big part of the reason why airplanes can produce lift. So, here's how induced drag is generated. Keep in mind that the underside of the wing has higher pressures of air, while the air above the wing has lower pressures. At the wingtip, air from underneath the wing continuously travels up to fill the areas of low pressure. This generates a lot of vortices, with the center of the vortex, represented by the vortex line, being the far edge of a wing. The vortex's starting upwards motion is from the front of the plane, while the ending downwards motion is at the extremity, or the back, of the wingspan. What this effectively does is it causes the net direction of airflow past the wing to be facing downwards. Essentially, it's pushing the air down. These vortices first tilt the lift vector slightly backward, and the horizontal component of the now tilted lift vector is induced drag. There are two main ways to reduce induced drag. One is to increase the wing's aspect ratio. The other is to reduce the air quantity produced upwards at the tip through means such as wing twisting. A special property of induced drag is that, unlike parasite drag, it is inversely proportional to the square of speed. As you increase in speed, induced drag decreases. Last but not least, here is total drag. It is simply the sum of both induced drag and parasite drag. Now, here's a fun question. At which speed should an aircraft fly? I'll give you a few seconds to figure this out. Now, you may have answered the point at which the total drag is the lowest. And sure, this sounds like it makes sense. We want lowest drag, right? 
logic follows that the lowest point has to be the most optimal speed to fly. But just think about it. If we were to slow down even slightly while we are at this point, that would equal more drag. This would further decrease speed, generating even more drag. And this would cause speed to further decrease, increasing drag even further, which decreases speed even more. Without more thrust or a descent, this can quickly lead to a stall or loss of control. So, in actuality, for stable flight, airplanes try to fly slightly faster than the point of lowest drag, as this is where a small speed decreases the drag as well, resulting in maximum range. So, here's a recap page of what we learned today. The two main types of drag are parasite and induced drag. Parasite drag can be split into three subtypes. Skin friction drag is the drag produced by an aircraft's rough surface as it moves throughout the air. Foam drag is produced by the turbulent wake caused by the separation of airflow from a surface. Interference drag is produced by different airflows interacting. Induced drag is produced as a byproduct of lift, generating a vortex at the tip of an aircraft's wing that tilt the lift vector slightly backwards. Total drag is the sum of parasite drag and induced drag. Aircrafts usually try to fly slightly faster to the point of lowest total drag. Here are the works cited. Thank you, and I'll see you next time.